Welcome back everyone to Box Markets. My name is Paul Hill and this first time exclusive, I am delighted to be able to speak to Oliver Brown of RC Brown, one of the UK's finest investors. So welcome, Oliver. Hi, Paul. Good to be with you. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, well, um, given the recent uncertainty surrounding the uh, Omicron variant, also sort of rising inflation expectations alongside tightening central bank policy, and we saw that yesterday in terms of the Federal Reserve, what's your sort of like broad outlook for equities as we look into 2022? Yeah, so it's an interesting one because there is a bit of a, you know, push-pull bull bear case going on in, in, in equity markets, which have, have come off their highs you know, we think that the UK equity market looks you know, relatively good value compared to certainly other new markets, particularly the US. We think there's lots of interesting small and mid-cap companies in, in, in the UK. And I, I'd probably even say there's a bit of value in, in the parts of the old economy FTSE 100, which has rather been written off. And the UK has been trading at a significant discount, which has only got wider uh, you know, this, past, this past year. Um, having said that, I, I'm always conscious that you know markets have had quite a good run or a really good run from the you know lows of last March, and and, and what slightly concerns me is I think there are investors out there who think that you know it's normal to make double digit returns year in year out on on the stock market, and it certainly isn't. So I, I do think 2022 will be will, will be quite difficult. Uh, that doesn't mean there aren't opportunities and, and we can't make money, but I think there's definitely. Uh, it's a stock picker's market. Um, and, you know, we've, we've got obviously the Omicron uh, variant at the moment, which we'll have to see how that, how that plays out. But it will- How do you think it will sort of like um, affect or impact the economy and pe- particularly people who are working, they contract it and then have to go into self-isolation? How do you think that's going to work out in the next three months? Well, very, very difficult to say because it's moving at such a pace, but clearly it's, it's not helpful and it's certainly not helpful for parts of the economy, particularly you know, your travel and leisure companies, which are you know, pub companies, they're again going to be on, on the back foot. And I think you know, it's, it's difficult times ahead for, for them. But you know, those that are well capitalised will, will come out of this and should, should take market share. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. But I think what the world has actually done pretty well now at, at coping with is this ongoing uncertainty. And you know, what you see is good businesses are able to adapt and they're able to, yeah, they're able to move with, with the times and um, you know, still, still perform reasonably well. Yeah, no, I'm pretty much upbeat as well. I think once we get throughout the next quarter and we're through uh, Omnicron, yes, it might be difficult in terms of supply chain, but actually, you know, the uh, the economy is underlying is, rel- is relatively strong, I think. So it should be decent. Now, just in terms of sort of like stock selection, what are you looking for going forward then in 2022? I mean, obviously decent companies, but but how do you actually define a decent company? What, what's the sort of the... Uh, the sweet spot for RC Brown. Yeah, so we like, yeah, we like quality companies, and what we mean by that is companies that are either market leaders in their sectors, or they've got a particular niche that we think is interesting, and we think we can go, they can go on and grow in that sector. We like companies that are sensibly valued, you know, valuations that we can understand and get on board with. Companies, you know, we clearly prefer companies that that make profits and even if they're not paying a dividend at least would have the ability to, to pay one and we want to have a well diversified portfolio across different market capitalizations different sectors um, and yeah that that's really really our bag and you know i can touch on our investment sort of process is what we call the primary opportunities process and what we mean by that is investing in companies typically at the stage that they're raising money and the reasons we do this is because if a company wants to raise money, it needs to open its books. It needs to tell us and other interested investors how it's trading. And, and what that does is it reduces the potential for a nasty outcome further down the line. We're buying with our, our eyes wide open. We can see the state of the business. We're also normally buying a discount to where the shares are trading at because if a company wants to raise money, then it will usually issue those shares at at, at a discount. And again, we're buying shares because these are newly issued shares that we're normally buying. We're not buying, we're not paying any stamp duty or or commission, which doesn't, you know, obviously doesn't add cost to the, to our, to our portfolios either. So that's, 
that's our, our thesis. Yeah, really. it seems to be a sort of like a, um, a real area of expertise for R.C. Brown in the sort of the primary sort of fundraising market. She's been really active in the uh, in, in IPOs. And we'll just in terms of sort of like the level, the health of the IPO market, what you're seeing at the moment, I mean, is it is it being affected by the year end slowdown? But you expect you expect it to sort of like uh, pick up next year because I mean, obviously, it was very strong earlier on. Yes. So it's been an active year for, 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 for fundraisings and obviously IPOs are part of that. You know, we saw, we've seen around about £30 billion raised on the London market this year, which is similar to last year, which are two you know, high, high years for, for, for mm. equity raisings. The IPO market has been pretty buoyant this year. There's been, there's been plenty in the small cap area as well. Uh, you're right, the last six, seven weeks, things have gone a bit quieter and it's definitely been tougher for, uh, you know, for, for, for firms to get their, uh, get, get their companies IPO. I think there's a bit of fatigue in, in, in truth. Um, and also, you know, the latest sort of Omicron concerns, concerns haven't, haven't helped. But, you know, my view, actually, it's been quite a healthy market. What we don't like is IPO markets that are, you know, everything's, everything, you know, going to 30% premiums and there's money flying in from all over the place. And to us, that's, that's not rational, that's not healthy. Whereas at the moment, actually, you're seeing good companies that are, have got, you know, particularly interesting area or sector or niche and a good story to tell are able to float and, able, and are floating on sensible valuations. And those that perhaps don't uh, are, are actually quietly getting pulled. So that's actually quite healthy, in, in my view. Mm. Well, you, ju you just um, IPO'd or helped IPO a couple of them. And we'll just start with one, Eno Aqua uh, um, Tech, which I understand is sort of an expert in um, all things sort of like energy saving and um, water saving for sort of consumers, etc. And it seems to be uh, growing really well and also having, it's got generating sort of 20% EBIT margin. So it's obviously got something there, which is uh, pretty, pretty good. Yes, we, we think it's uh, we think it's a good company. I mean, it's it's, it's IPO very very recently. Uh, as you say, it's sort of a water energy and efficiency company. So, if you've ever been in a, in a shower uh, at a hotel and the water pressure has been pretty variable, well, these guys will sort that out for for, for you. So their 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 end customers are sort of housing associations. You've got lots of apartments, uh, hotel groups, leisure centres, that kind of thing. And and the other part of their business is. Uh, is, is, is taking out old heating systems and replacing them with the heat pump systems as well, the new heat pump systems that are coming in. And, and as you say, the company is growing well. We think it's pretty modesty value. It's early days, but you know, we think it's one to watch. Mm. Yeah, I mean, the heat pumps, is that, obviously that's a big sort of ESG green angle, isn't it, for, uh, for sort of investors, I presume, because it's uh, efficiency saving. Yeah, I, I, absolutely. The ESG you know, quality yeah. company. And Another, another one on the sort of like the ESG electric vehicle side is uh, is Sieta, which uh, does axial flux um, electric motors, which I think they're targeting for sort of two or three wheelers out in Asia. And uh, the shares have done, I mean, you've done really well. I think they floated about 120 in the middle of the year. And uh, looking at it, they've almost doubled, they've over doubled. So uh, you've done very well out of that. Yeah, they, they've done well. Uh, as you say, it's a sort of technology, battery technology company, electric vehicles, you're right. It's the, the light vehicles, the, the mopeds uh, in, in Asia rather than your, your Teslas. Um, and, and we just like the, you know, the, the management team. They seem very sensible, very pragmatic. And they wanted, they were coming to the market, they're IPOing for the right reasons. They wanted to raise money now because the opportunity to get their product completely sort of you know finished and you know ready and out to the market was was now that you know mm. very much the the tailwinds behind these sort of companies so yeah for us it's an exciting company and we certainly hope there'll be uh, more to come and it wouldn't be a great surprise if they, if they raise more money at some point in the future you know as and when the orders start coming in mm. there seems to be a lot of m a in there as well because i saw mercedes buying one of their competitors around uh, yasa which is, was just down the road so uh, i think this is sort of like uh, a premium for sort of like rarity as well because um you know if you've got something in this area that's pretty unique then uh, there aren't many i think oems who have this technology um now as we're talking about christmas i do see another one you've uh, you've sort of what was ipo'd in june artisanal spirits so uh i guess you've been trying the product out have you at all it's scotch whiskey so i understand 
Yeah, well, I probably say it quietly. I'm not not a great whiskey fan. Uh, oh, okay. Group, but, uh, may, maybe uh, yeah, there is a member of my family who's getting uh, he's getting some 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 Scotch Scotch whiskey. So um, yeah, lucky them. Yeah. yeah. What was it, what what attracted you to this one? Because they raised was it 15 million pounds at uh, at 112p. They're about uh, in fact they're about 10 percent down actually than their IPO. So yeah, probably offering value there. Yeah, so this is one that we put into our uh, AIM inheritance tax portfolios, uh, and as you say, it's it, 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 its brand is it's a members club, and its brand is the Scottish Malt Whisky Society. Um, they've got a loyal customer base in the UK. What really interested us is the the overseas angle. Um, you know, you've got mm. the premiumisation, you've got people getting wealthier overseas and the developed in the developing markets, uh, and, and people are prepared to pay you know significant premiums for you know whiskies and, and, and exclusive whiskies. The management aim to double the sales of this company over the next five years, and and you know the, the shares do offer in our view some value because they are trading in a steep discount. You know, and they're running around sort of three times sales, which is a significant discount sort of like other um, mm. global spirits brands. Yeah, no, I mean I would agree, and particularly I know uh, India is sort of like they love their whiskey, and I think they've also I think I think the US has just removed the tariffs, hasn't it? Import tariffs on Scottish whiskey, so that one must must have been putting a bit of a dampener on the uh, on the whole industry before, and now you should see uh, probably a lot of catch up actually, because there'll be uh, you know I don't know what the, the the tariffs were, but it's got to help the industry, hasn't it? Yeah, it should help. Obviously, any sort of barriers to trade are, are not good, and you know, for exporters, and you know, especially this company. Mm. Another one, actually, on the um, the ESG theme, which came out with a trading update uh, yesterday. It's quite topical. Music Magpie, which is a sort of like a, I think it's a reseller of sort of consumer technologies, sort of smartphones, laptops. But also not just the technology side, but also I think it's sort of like uh, it does old CDs and DVDs and books as well. And it, it came out with a very good sort of like inline um, trading update yesterday. Yeah, so you're right. The business started by you know selling uh, you know books and, and CDs, but you know, more recently has morphed into you know consumer technology. So it refurbishes it. So you may have an old. Um, smartphone or tablet that, that you don't need anymore so you can you, you sell it to them they'll refurbish it and they'll um, sell it on and, and what you're finding is that people still want to have up-to-date technology but but accepted you know in this in this in this day and age you know you can be spending a thousand pounds on the latest samsung or an iphone and not everyone can do that or wants to do that um so this this allows people to still have you know modern and up-to-date technology that works well What's I think really interesting about this company is the fact that it is building a, a rental model. So you can now mm. rent, um, for example, smartphones from them. So you may be paying nine ninety nine a month for a relatively um, sort of basic iPhone, and that can increase to nineteen ninety nine, twenty four ninety nine for more up to date models. And, the, and the, the beauty of that is the stock market will simply value that business at a higher multiple because that's a customer that is then. You know, locked in for a period and is likely to carry on. You know, we don't we don't tend to change our our, our mobile phone contracts very often in the same way that you know people are not likely once they've signed up to the music magpie proposition and they'll have the ability to upgrade in 12 months time if if they want as well. They're also moving uh, moving into the US as well, which is obviously a, a, a huge market. And you know, as you mentioned, it is a good environmental play. It, they are increasing the lifespan of you know, consumer technology products. Um, mm. So you know, it's rather better that they get refurbished and, and have a longer life rather than end up in, in landfill. Yeah, and I guess this is really appealing, isn't it, to the millennials? It's people who sort of, or, the, or Gen Z, people who are sort of like slightly younger and uh, not only want to go for the environmental angle, but they're just used to paying a subscription rather than paying as a one-off cost, isn't it, for a sort of like a, a mobile phone or, or, or a laptop. Now, I did actually, it is run by um, the founder, isn't it, Steve Oliver? And is that sort of like an important trait for a lot of these um, IPOs? Is sort of, you know, sort of like still have that continuity of management team to really drive and to energize that, those type of businesses? Is that, is that a sort of feature that you look for in terms of IPOs or you're not that, not that concerned? I think it's. It's good to have, and it is good to have the founder there. But you know, founders sometimes uh, are not always the best chief executives um, because 
you know, listing on the, on the public markets, you know, comes with its own stresses and strains. So mm. it, it really depends. But I think, I think broadly it's positive to have them there. And, and what you want is they've built a, a significant business. They floated it. You now want them to take it on to the next level because, you know, we have invested in that company. We provided them with more capital. And mm. if the management's any good, they're going to use that money to go on and grow the company, grow profits, hopefully pay dividends. And obviously, you know, that's good for shareholders. Yeah. Another company, actually, with a, I think, which is IPO, well, sort of over the last sort of six months, is Revolution Beauty, that has a, a, a sort of founder as a CEO. And I know I've spoken to him, Alan Minto. And uh, I mean, he's just absolutely, to me, he's fabulous. I don't know what you've thought about. Well, if you want to take us through the company, it obviously does affordable quality um, cosmetics and um, hair care and skincare products that uh, it sells underneath its Revolution brand, I think. Yeah, no, absolutely. Really, really exciting company and certainly one that we consider to be a, a disruptive company you know, in, the, in the sort of makeup and skincare company um, in, uh, sector. You'll find it in Boots and, and Superdrug, but it is growing. You know, its online sales are growing now significantly. It's growing well internationally and it is able to make products, you know, much cheaper than, than some of the competitors and still sell them, um, you know, for very good margins. But, you know, they are significantly cheaper than the likes of L'Oreal and, and Revlon. And we, we do think it's an industry that is ripe for a shake up, you know, for a long time. The likes of uh, the competitors would, would be putting, you know, these glossy adverts in, in magazines, which is very expensive. And what these guys have been really, really good at doing is using sort of social media and influencers to uh, attract, uh, you know, relatively young um, customer base and, and, and it really has uh, has taken off so we, we think it's uh, one to watch and they've got a men's uh, a men's range coming out in February. oh right nice one well that might be of interest to me that's for sure yeah. <laughs> but I did I did just talk about that international angle which is really quite interesting isn't it because uh, they've got already the big footprint in um, in Target and I think they're the best-selling cosmetics um, brand there alongside uh, Ultra Beauty. And they just signed, actually, a huge retailer out in the States. And they wouldn't divulge who it is. I can probably guess, but uh, it'd be a bit remiss of me. But it does show you, doesn't it, that the actual growth in the world's biggest beauty market, they're, they're really taking to the Revolution brand, which could, even when you say is as a disruptor, could really sort of like move the dial on the top line. Yeah, no, absolutely. And it's, you know, it's still got a tiny, you know, share of, global market share so there's an awful lot to go at so we, we think it's we certainly think it's one to watch yeah and then it's sort of coming full circle really to sort of like the diy market another one which um sort of like uh ipo'd uh or a couple of them were just recently was cmo group and uh, lord's trading and i think cmo do so they're an online retailer building product so that must be pretty tough and uh, we've got Lord's Trading, which I think is a sort of building plumbing DIY type. Can you just take us through both of those? Yeah, so CMO, uh, you know, online retailer of building materials, you know, they're the management have said they want to be the ASOS of, sort of building materials world. Um, so, you know, hope, hopefully they'll, they'll uh, achieve How that. do you do that? I mean, well, that's a real USP because... I mean, you can't Amazon as sort of like a, a pallet of bricks or whatever. That, I'm not sure what they do. I mean, no, absolutely, and it, it is a it, it's a really underpenetrated market. You know, in the pre-pandemic, we wouldn't really have thought of, of going online and ordering things like that. We'd have gone to our builder merchants, we'd gone to B and Q, but actually, it makes a lot of sense. And one thing we've we've all got much more used to is ordering online, and we had to do it you know, during the pandemic during lockdown. We had no option. And actually, it makes a lot of sense if you need some bricks or you need some patio slabs um, delivered. They're heavy. You don't really want to be going somewhere, mm. you know, getting them in your car, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and you know, the company raised you know, money at that IPO um, you know, to, to fund, fund acquisitions, you know, to further to go into other areas as well. Because, so, I mean, they're, 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 as I say, to make that a successful model, I mean, they're going to be best in class because there aren't that many even in the class are there <laughs> who'd be able to do that yeah it, it's a sort of winner winner takes all really yeah and what about sort of lord's trading i mean this is obviously the repair and maintenance and continuing to sort of like people building out their kitting out their own homes i guess is sort of like you know the plumbing and i mean we're putting some carpets in and we're still struggling to get people to come in to do our 
sort of like, you know, put a sink in or, or, or mend the tap and all that kind of stuff. So it just shows you there's still a lot of pent up demand in consumers to be able to do the RMI market. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a theme which, which we think will continue, you know, for the next year or two. And, and that is you know, people wanting to make their homes nicer places to live because they are, you know, we're spending more time there now and, that, and that's likely to, to continue. You know, Lord's relatively simple business. It's a build of merchants. Uh, they've got sites predominantly in the in the, in the uh, southeast. Uh, we expect them to grow that, that footprint. It's very much a buy and build strategy. You know, sensible management. It's going to be consolidated in the sector, but their online presence is growing as well. Around about twenty-five percent of sales are now coming from online, so they're yeah. not ignoring that area. But there's certainly still a still a, a a place for people who want to go and you know look at their look at their products. And you know, just going back to sort of CMO, the big advantage they have of being online is that they've got seventy-five thousand lines of stock on their on their website. Whereas you go to a, a builders merchant, you know. A, Typical builders and merchants only four thousand nine. So that the, you know, we know that the choice that you can get online is is rather greater. Mm. And is that sort of like talking obviously with with areas you're going into areas you're sort of like uh, avoiding? I'm just guessing is sort of like um, traditional physical store only type of retailers would be. Would, would, is that is that an area that you're looking for value, or is that an area that you're ste- steering clear of? Yeah, we don't we don't have a lot in that area. I didn't um, think you did. You seem a you seem a sensible no. man. <laughs> no, I mean if if you are going to have that, it's very much fine. You're going to have a presence uh, on on the high street or or in or in you know retail parks. That's okay, but you do need an online offering. So we hold Dunelm. We think Dunelm is sort of a best in class business. We hold Hotel Chocolat as well. But Hotel Chocolat came out of being a um, you know, a mail order company. So, you know, for them, yes, they've got a high street presence, but actually a lot of their business is done online anyway. And when the shops were shut last year, all you saw was that the sales just moved online, um, which for them is great. Yeah. Yeah, I think the department stores have seen their day, though, these traditional ones. I mean, we've had uh, all kinds of them which have been uh, been struggling. Now, um, just moving on to um, uh, sort of like, it's, it's still in the home, but again, it's a new one, which... Uh, was IPO'd in November, actually. I've never even heard of them before. So obviously you've been keeping your keep keeping tabs on the IPO market is Stellran Group, which does um it manufactures and sells steel panel radiators across Europe and the UK and uh, Turkey, doesn't it? I mean, what 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 sort of attracts you to um to radiators? Yeah, I mean it, fair, fair, not not possibly the most exciting company in our portfolio, <laughs> but it is a UK market leader. It has got a 50, over 50% market share in the UK. You've probably got, unwittingly, a stale radiator in your own home. It's got about 20% market share in Europe. Wow. And, you know, this is another company. We, we've spoken again about Lords and CMO. It's another beneficiary of home improvements. You know, people mm. want to make their homes a nice place to be. They want to make them warmer. Um, we actually think long-term this is a, a, a another beneficiary of the rollout of uh, heat source pumps, you know, as as they come into play and um, gas boilers get get taken out. Because if with a heat source pump, you need to have radiators which got a a, a larger uh, surface area um, because you've got water that is at a lower temperature. And Stellrad sort of specialise in these these radiators because they're a more sort of premium brand. Uh, And there is a fashion at the moment to have sort of larger radiators. Don't try and hide them in your home, try and make them look nice. So we, we think there's uh, you know, there's plenty of things for this company, uh, plenty of positives, and it's not an expensive company. It's due to pay mm-hmm. a dividend yield over three percent as well. So we bought it um, because we think it's it's in a good position. It's a sensible, steady company, and we think the shares should, should do reasonably well. Yeah, good. And then sort of moving on to some other interesting situations, you've got Agronomics, which I think is an investment firm, sort of focused on cellular. Um, Aqua, you know, culture. So effectively, is it to sort of develop and create um, sort of like um, animal proteins, but in a, in the lab rather than actually using proper animals, and therefore you get the same type of product? Is is that sort of like their their, their thesis? I, I don't know. Yeah, no, very much, very much. It's got a holding in in sort of eighteen uh, eighteen investments. You know, they are early stage companies because it's it's about as you say, cultivated meat, which is growing meat uh, in in a lab and that that really is the holy grail if you can if you can create a, a really nice steak and, and create it from a laboratory and 
no one knows any difference or, mm. or, or it tastes as good, then, you know, as you say, that really is, uh, in, in our view, in, in our view, the future, because one of the problems you've got in a, in a world that is developing uh, and people, as people get wealthier, they want to eat more meat and, and red meats. And, you know, unfortunately, that isn't good for the, uh, for the environment. So, you know, th this company is investing in, in those companies that are going to help, hopefully help solve that problem. They've also got fish companies as well uh, and other sort of plant-based proteins. You know, we think this is a really exciting area uh, mm. as a result of, of have invested in, in, in this business. They raised some, some more money recently um, in order to, 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 and and how, what attracts you to the CIO? I think it's is it Jim Mellon, is it? He was, was quite famous, actually, for all kinds of different type of investors. I'm surprised it wasn't um, Oliver Brown heading it up. <laughs> wow. <laughs> no comment, no comment. No, Jim Mellon's uh, got a very, very good record. Um, so, you know, it, it, it can be... It can be worth backing, you know. Well, it's certainly worth backing good good management teams. Obviously, you've got to think what they're up to is, is sensible as well. But um, you know, this has got uh, it's got Jim Mellon involved, and it's also got um, one of the guys behind Instant Smoothies as well. Oh, okay. So yeah. Reed, Reed, forgotten his first name, but the Richard Reed, Richard Reed. There you go. Right, and presumably for these type of things, where it's sort of like futuristic sort of technology, you need some expertise there, isn't it? As in like some real industry in, in expertise as well. I mean, and obviously, the city gym and uh, the you know, the other guy has got has got a reasonable level, but you need some presumably some biologists or somebody who's been able to be able to sort of like kick the tires on these things. Oh, oh, absolutely, and that's why for us as a generous investor, this is this makes is a sensible way of playing a space that is you know still pretty nascent. Yeah. Um, we've got exposure to you know 18 businesses and that will grow and you know the hope is that a few of them become really really substantial companies in time mm. one of them they're now moving on to um electrosurgical devices now uh, this has been around for some time creo medical um but i think uh, has it reached a sort of like an raised some money didn't it 36 million pounds in august at about 182p and the shares are a bit lower than that now at the moment but what sort of attracts you to the long-term sort of like trajectory of electrical, um, you know, sort of instruments? Yes. Yeah, so, so Creo floated in, in 2016 um, and, you know, it makes these, well, one of the things it does is make sort of small devices that are used in, in, in surgery for, for cancer patients. You know, the advantage is that it's, it's much more minimally invasive, which, you know, helps to improve client outcomes. It, it's a company that has stalled a little bit in the last couple of years. COVID hasn't helped because mm. it means that they haven't been able to get out in the field as so much and, and train up surgeons in order to sort of sort of take their take their products. So I think there's an important, it's certainly an important year ahead for this company. Um, you know, the shares have done well since IPO. They just happened to rather stalled in the last couple of years. And as you say, they've raised money. Um, you know, earlier this year, and, and and those you know the shares have drifted. And what's the USP of the electric? Because presumably they compete against some of the electric for the for the US guys, don't they? The America, the the devices, or is it really sort of quite unique? So I can remember having my nose cauterized when I was a kid, and it was extremely extremely painful at the time in the in the doctor's surgery. So uh, I, I remember what these things are like, but they do stop um, bleeding, don't they, and stuff like that. Yeah. They help. They promote coagulation. Yeah, no, it's, it's it's got a it's got a unique te technology. Um, you know that the, the you know, people are very excited about. There's there's definitely a, a sort of a fan club of investors behind this business. Um, you know, I think it, it, it's it's now time for it to um, uh, to deliver really, and, and we're looking for for news flow into sort of 2022. Yeah, well, I'll say investors have a look at this. I know Edison have put out a valuation of 240 p compared to the current shares at about 145. So there's definitely upside there. Now, just moving to sort of the consultancy side, uh, Elixir International, um, which I think sort of is a smaller version of people like Bain and McKinsey, isn't it? Is it sort of like it does all that sort of top level strategic consultancy? Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, I think it would call itself a challenger to the consulting market, as you say, the, the, the likes of Capgemini, and it would certainly believe that it's a, a, more, a more nimble company you know, yes, they help clients with you know, strategy, perhaps overseas expansions and regulation, maybe the rollout of sort of IT systems. You know, got some very high profile clients, you know, HSBC, Mars, Tesla, uh, ASOS. And actually, this really shows the beauty of, you know, in our view of investing in IPOs, because if you get into a, a company 
uh, at IPO uh, at a sensible valuation. And this company has consistently you know, beat its forecast. It's under promise. It's over delivered. You know, the shares floated only last year at 217 pence. You know, they're now, they're now, wow. they're now north of seven pounds. You know, the management, you know, the chief executive is very ambitious. Um, you know, expanding teams. He will, will look to take on other teams and perhaps buy some companies as well. Um, so it, it is now on a, on a premium re- rating, um, but they have really delivered and, you know, hopefully there's more to come. Yeah. And then just um, just finally, in this sort of our professional services, we've got K3 Capital, which I think is a sort of like a sort of a, a, an M&A stroke sort of corporate recovery, forensics and tax advisory business, isn't it, in the UK, which... Uh, Again, I think IPO did, or it raised ten million pounds in July. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it's a professional services company, very much focused on the on the sort of SME market. And you know, we live in a world where you know, it's getting more complicated, and you know, companies need advice. So they're they're definitely beneficiaries of, of, of this. You know, whether it be tax, whether it be corporate finance, whether it be restructuring. And you're right; they they raised ten million pounds in order to buy a, a couple of companies um, called Knights. And mm, that's right. on, a, on a relatively modest rating, um, you know, K3 is, is trading on a, on, a, on a higher multiple of that. So it is, you know, immediately earnings enhancing, you know, and this is, this is, they've got a good record since they floated in 2017. It's not an expensive company. It pays you a three and a half percent yield as well, which is certainly not to be sniffed at. So, you know, the shares have been relatively um, flat since the raising, but, you know, we think there is, there is value there. Mm. And then just finally, sort of like for, for, for next year, what sort of like risks you, people should watch out for? Is it sort of like a combination of Chinese property blowing up or staying on a zero tolerance of, of COVID or is it just new variants? Or how, how do you see that sort of things to, for investors to keep a tabs on? Yeah, so I think you have to accept that the, the COVID story, you know, will ebb and flow. We're currently in one of those, you know, situations where there is uncertainty and as a result, markets have, have come back a little bit, but not, not hugely. I think as long as vaccines continue to hold, then, you know, that, 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 that's, we should be okay, but that's, that is an if. Um, the China property thing, I'm not overly concerned about that. I think the Chinese authorities um, will keep it pretty well contained. And it's not like in sort of 2008, 2009, where, you know, the US housing problem resulted in, you know, in a, in a global financial crisis, because China is, is more self-contained. Um, I think higher inflation and it, and it staying sort of stubbornly high is, is an area of concern for us. You know, this, the, the global supply chains are, are creaking a little bit and, and we think that's going to continue to be a, a, an issue. Um, central bank tapering, there were some concerns that they were going to taper too quickly, but I think the latest strain of, of the variant has probably put, put paid to that. And, and I think one thing they really don't want to do is, is raise rates too quickly and you know, snuff out um, you know, the recovery. So I think it'll be a, a sort of a slow a slow plod really in, in 2022 there'll be ups and downs there'll be things that will happen that we're we're completely you know we're not, we haven't maybe even thought of yet um mm. but you know there is there is some value you know in in, in the uk market and, and pockets of the market as well so it's, it's yeah i think it, there's already a, a level of uh, safety of margin isn't there in the uk i mean the us trades at about 20 times next year's earnings and i think the the, the footsies are roughly around about 14 well i last saw it 13 14 and it's even cheaper i think in the small cap area as well you can get some real sort of like special situations yes and, and that's why you've seen a lot of m&a activity you know in, in, in small and mid caps uh, in the uk this year and you know whilst that discount continues to exist relative to other markets then you know our, our companies will keep getting picked off mm. And then finally, I know you're off to a uh, Christmas uh, lunch treat with your with your team later on. Are we going to get a Santa rally? Well, we're trying to have one this morning. We were up uh, about sixty <laughs> points earlier, um, so yeah, who knows? Who knows? I mean, the market there's not a huge amount of volume at the moment, so it, it is likely to get blown around by um, you know news and particularly COVID news. So. Um, um. Don't know is the answer. Hopefully. Yeah, it was only, it's a bit late, isn't it? It's sort of like a week or ten days to go. So uh, we may have a strong first quarter if we can get the get the. If we can see the back of Omnicrom, it's got to help a lot. Uh, a lot of certainly domestically focused companies, anyway. Yeah, no, I I would agree with that. 
Yeah. Well, thanks very much for your time, Oliver. And just um, if if people want to actually um, invest in any of the RC Brown funds, where's best to sort of like uh, to contact? Is it contact you or go on the website or? Yeah. So we, we've got a website um, that is dedicated to our fund. The fund is called the IFSL RC Brown UK Primary Opportunities Fund, www.rcbpo. .co.uk. Um, you should be able to find details. Feel free to uh, to, to ping us um, a message from that. Um, we can add you to the mailing list as well. Great. Okay. Well, uh, look forward in again in touching base in about six months' time and seeing how uh, those uh, exciting uh, stock ideas are fair. So uh, thanks very much, Oliver, and uh, speak to you in 2022. Okay. Thank you and have a good Christmas.